Morning everyone, thank you for joining us for this webinar. The purpose of this session is to provide you with a full update on the revised furlough scheme, the new furlough scheme that's come back into place um, at quite short notice. Um, the reason why we've decided to um, run this session for you is that we've had lots and lots of questions about the new scheme, including you know lots of kind of detail on the rules. And so pulled together a few of the experts in the team that have been looking at this and um, try to think about all the questions that we've been asked and put that into one session for you. So I hope you'll find that useful. Um, if you do want to contact us with any further thoughts or questions, then you can find details for that in the invitation that you received um, to attend today. So just to introduce you to who we've got here today, Sarah Peacock, who's a partner in our Southampton team. Uh, James Collings, a partner in the team in Truro. Charlie Maples, Charlie's a managing associate and Charlie has been um, working tirelessly on providing many of the updates that you've seen. Quite often they do have my name on them, but I'll let you into a secret. Quite often it's Charlie that's done most of the hard work on those late at night. So it'd be really good to hear from Charlie today. Um, so just, yep, just to start, so over to Sarah. So Sarah, um, we're going to sort of start off talking first of all about the specifics of the scheme and the basics of it. So just as a reminder, um, can you can you talk about you know, who can claim under this extended CJRS? Yes, so, um, so if you're claiming for a period that ends on or before the 31st of October, you can only claim if you've previously furloughed your employees before the 1st of July and have submitted a claim for this by the 31st of July. Um, so this might differ if they're returning from parental leave. Um, if you're claiming for a period that starts on or after the 1st of November, then you can only claim for furloughed employees that were employed and on the payroll on the 30th of October. So this means that you must have made an RTI submission to HMRC between the 20th of March and the 30th of October notifying the payment of earnings for that employee. As under the previous scheme, you can claim for employees and workers on any type of employment contract, so zero hours, flexible working, part-time, full-time, etc. And there's actually no maximum number of employees that you can claim for from the 1st of November. Thanks, Sarah. I think that's really helpful. So basically, it's about sitting down and looking at the relevant dates and making sure that the employees that you want to claim for were on the RTI at the relevant time. And I meant to mention at the beginning, actually, one of the key things that is a change from what businesses were planning previously is that the CJRS bonus that was due to be payable has been withdrawn because of the extension of the scheme. We've heard from a number of clients that that cash amount had already been put into the cash flow so that is actually quite a disappointing element I think it does make sense from a sort of policy perspective because with the scheme being extended the idea of having a bonus for returning people from furlough um, becomes becomes undermined but I, do, I, I you know it is something to very much note and if it's something that you haven't um, seen yet do take notice of that because certainly your you know your finance teams might have been um, relying on that money coming through um, so thinking about um, what you were saying there, do, you, do, do businesses need to have used the furlough scheme previously to be able to use it this time? No, um, so you can use it for the first time as long as you meet the criteria. So just to remind you about that, um, if you cannot maintain your workforce because your operations have been affected by coronavirus, you can furlough employees and apply for the grant to cover a portion of their usual monthly wage costs. Um, when you, as long as you record them as being furloughed, and um, subject obviously to what I've just said about them being on the payroll. Yeah, and you mentioned that it covers a wide range of employees and workers. What about employees who are on maternity leave? What are the options there? Yeah, so with maternity leave, um, the employee can come off furlough. So what they can do is they can give their eight weeks notice that they have to give normally. Um, and then at the end of that eight week notice period, then that they can be furloughed. Um, of course, actually, if the scheme ends before they've intended to return, they're not going to be able to go back on maternity leave. So they need to be aware of that. Um, but there is a funny little quirk in it. So the guidance in a different section says that if your employee is on 
or who has re recently returned from statutory parental leave, so that's any parental leave, not just maternity leave, you can claim through the scheme for enhanced contractual pay. So it's not absolutely clear, but what we understand that to mean that if your employee in, um, receives enhanced contractual maternity pay or something similar, they can be furloughed simultaneously, but you will only be able to claim back the 80% of the enhancement, not the statutory pay. So obviously that's not the case for those employees that only receive statutory pay. They have to come off the turn to leave first. To be that's prepared. interesting. Yeah, it's perhaps quite unexpected, isn't it? So that's definitely um, one that's worth looking at. Yeah. I do think, I mean, it, I think it would depend on you probably, I mean, we'll talk about sort of reputational issues later, but you probably want to be using the scheme more generally rather than just using it for those specific um, examples within the business, I think. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, Charlie, we've talked in the team quite a bit on the updated guidance and what it means in relation to notice periods. You know, we've got lots of clients that were already looking at restructuring for various different reasons. So what's the, the headline change in respect of notice and furlough? So the headline change was it was signalled in the guidance they issued and then last week it was confirmed that you cannot claim for employees that are working under notice where that notice falls on or after the 1st of December. That's a significant change because under the old version of the CGRS, you could continue to furlough and claim for people who are working contractual or statutory notice. So it effectively means that the old scheme meant you could subsidise notice periods and lots of our clients extended notice periods to help out their employees, give them longer to get to the job market. You can't do that anymore because you'll be, you'll be paying the full cost of any extended notice. You can, however, claim for notice periods that are running before December. So it's only kicking in on the 1st of December. You can claim for statutory or contractual notice that runs up until the end of November. Yeah, and what should an employer do if they've already got someone on furlough who's, who's going to be serving notice on or after the 1st of December? Well, I think the real changes is there's no real, no real incentive to keep the employee technically employed and working out their notice. So what you want to do about that depends upon whether you can really use them for work or not in reality. So I think if you've got someone who's serving out some of their notice already, then certainly make full use of the scheme until the end of November. Um, in terms of any notice periods that are run part or full after December, I think you can either ask them to return to work um, end their furlough and work out their notice period if you've got something that you can require them to do and you feel that they're going to do that. Um, but if you haven't got anything for them to do, which a lot of employers will find themselves in that scenario, that's the reason why this person was furloughed in the first place. Um, if you haven't got anything that you can ask them to do, then you could choose to just pay them in lieu of their notice period, as you might have done in, in ordinary circumstances. The one minor benefit of doing that would mean that you save on the holiday that would accrue during a notice period, which can be significant if you've got long notices. Yeah. And um, what about the, the pay? So do you still have to pay the employee the normal pre-furlough pay for that notice period, even when you can't claim for it? Yeah, so the government introduced legislation in relation to the last furlough scheme, which they've now extended to the new furlough scheme, um, which has got a very long name, and it basically amends the Employment Rights Act. And it basically means that if your employee has got statutory notice, um, then they're entitled to have that statutory notice calculated um, in line with their pre-furlough pay. The specific ways in which you calculate that and what the relevant date is, but that legislation was brought in to make sure that you don't base their statutory notice pay on furlough pay amounts to make sure they get the full benefit of that. The situation is still the same as it was under the old scheme in relation to contractual notice where you're giving a week or more than you're required to by statutory notice requirements. If you're giving a lot more notice under your contract, then actually what they're entitled to comes down to a matter of contractual interpretation. There is an argument that if you've um, asked somebody to be furloughed on very express provisions that say that their notice period, for example, will be paid at the furlough rate, if you are giving that lengthier notice, you may be able to say that you can pay the notice at the 80%. In our experience, most people didn't do that sort of express provision when they were furloughing people. And we think there'd be a very good argument if there's any grey area, a tribunal is likely to say employees were agreeing to be furloughed at 80% of pay in order to keep their job. They weren't agreeing to get 80% of pay 
for their notice period. So the safest position is going to be paying 100%. Come to us if you think you've got an argument and we'll have a look about look at your agreements. That's really helpful. Thanks, Charlie. James, we've had lots of questions about um, the interaction between sickness and sick leave and furlough. Um, it's been quite a difficult area to manage in practice. Do you have some thoughts on the practicalities of how employers might want to look at those sorts of circumstances? Yeah, it's a really challenging area. Uh, I mean, I think when you when you look back, you know, right the way back to the beginning, so back to you know ninth of April when um, yeah, there's the update to the to the original sort of guidance. It made clear that that sort of furlough wasn't intended to sort of tackle short-term absences linked linked to COVID or because someone was self-isolating. Uh, what it said was actually in that sort of scenario, you know, you should be paying SSP subject or yeah or company sick pay subject to eligibility requirements uh, being met. Um, now at the time, if you sort of think back, that that wasn't as much of an issue as it is now in practice because the reality was that you had to furlough someone for a minimum period of sort of three weeks so actually uh, the, the there wasn't as much of, of, of a sort of temptation to use it for, for that sort of self-isolation period and, and things like that now because we've got this scenario where you can sort of th there's no minimum period of sort of furlough that you have to do it there probably is more of a temptation for employers to to, to sort of think well actually can can we put someone on it um, and there is a bit of a challenge there um, you know, because it, it becomes a bit grey. Um, the latest guidance on it basically says uh, short-term illness self-isolation should not be a consideration when deciding whether to, to um, you know, furlough an employee um, but if, if employers want to furlough employees for business reasons and they're currently off sick they're eligible to do so as with other employees uh, and in those cases the employee should no longer receive sick pay and will be classified as a furloughed employee. Now that creates a bit of a weird grey area particularly around this sort of question of well hang on a second what exactly is the you know what are the sort of legitimate sort of business reasons why you could furlough. Now the obvious reason would be you know if, if for example you were shutting down an entire factory and you were putting everyone in the factory on onto furlough if there was a few employees there that were off sick at the time or, or were sort of self-isolating it's saying well actually it's legitimate to treat them the same way as you would everyone else because you're furloughing everyone so that's absolutely fine but we're definitely seeing that there are some challenging areas there you know particularly if um uh, yeah, a particular section of a business has to sort of shut down due to self-isolation issues. Where, where does that sort of leave us? It, it is a bit of a challenging area uh, and the reality is I think each each and every scenario needs to be looked at quite closely to, to, you know, to gauge the sort of level of risk there around you know, what, uh, what way would HMRC look at that particular scenario later on down the line. So it is a bit of a danger area. Okay, thanks. Um, and I, I guess talking about danger areas, Sarah, what do we think around the kind of reputation issues? We now know that um, HMRC will be publishing um, the names of employers that choose to use the furlough scheme. Um, so I, I know we've had quite a few questions about this, where there are grey areas, employers are starting to think about what that means for their reputation, because this is public money. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yes, from the 1st of December, HMRC can publish the name of the employers um, or um, and also the actually amount that they're claiming. So the amount or reasonable indication of that. Uh, so obviously that could result in bad publicity for them, uh, particularly if they're then sort of talking about how profitable they've been and all the rest of it. Um, what is probably more important is that employees can access that information because it will be public and they can see that if their employer is claiming for employees that are meant to be furloughed and they're actually working, they're not going to be very happy about that. So they can then contact, um, they can whistleblow, they can contact this anonymous phone line or go through the reporting service, the digital reporting service, um, and report their employers. So, so yeah, so it's sort of um, a bit of a risky measure. And I think, you know, a lot of employers 
are no longer going to take advantage of the scheme for that very reason, because mm -hmm. yeah, they they it, they don't want to be named and shamed, basically. I guess the distinction, I mean, hopefully, I'm pretty sure there's no one on this call that's claiming um, falsely for furlough. So more around, I suppose, the reputational issue, if the business is still trading um, in some way and it's less less clear maybe why furlough might need to be used, but there may well be lots of good business reasons why there are COVID factors impacting the business. So what do we think around, you know, employers thinking about that ahead and maybe having a narrative ready you know for gender pay reporting it's possible to have a narrative is there um is there a benefit do we think in employers sort of thinking about that now as they begin to implement the second part of the scheme why will they say they're using it and what are they you know what can they make public about that yeah i i think i think it's a really good idea so that they can make they can do comments and sort of talk about the reasoning behind that and that's going to sort of stand them in good stead and it will also mean that they can prepare comms so that if there is some sort of statement in the media then that they can respond to that and and you know i, I think that's perfectly reasonable and i think also the other thing is to make sure that they communicate that with their employees so if, if employees know the reasoning behind the furlough and why they're being furloughed and why they're claiming under the scheme even if they are sort of potentially profitable then then you know they're less likely to feel um disgruntled and blow the whistle on their employers so i think that's really important yeah thanks sarah charlie um in the first period of furlough there were lots of individuals i think that we heard about in the media and you know probably from people that we knew who fell just between the the cracks perhaps they'd only recently started a job um or they'd just left so in the in the new furlough what are the issues around rehiring and furloughing employees who've recently left or been dismissed and are now in a, a difficult situation because of the new lockdown yeah you'll still get those people who very recently started and won't meet the cutoff dates there will still be, there are always going to be people who miss out of the safe on the safety net what what they've done though is they've they've set a new date by which recent employees who've, who've recently left can be rehired and furloughed so if someone was employed on the 23rd of september and they were on RTI submission between the 20th of March and the 30th of October, you can re-employ them, furlough them and claim for them under the CJRS. Um, it's not entirely clear to me how that sits alongside the purpose of the CJRS, which is um, said to be where employment activities have been adversely affected by coronavirus. Um, or the measures taken to prevent it. Sometimes that person might have recently left because of coronavirus, but sometimes they won't have done. And I think employers do need to bear in mind, do we meet that general purpose before we just knee jerk rehire people because they've asked and they've read in the guidance that they could be? It's mm, mm, a really good point. Um, and what about employees who are on fixed term contracts that will end after the 1st of November? What's the position in relation to those? Yes, the guidance does explicitly say, as, as was the, the same under the original CGRS, that you can, um, you can extend those fixed term contracts um, and you can furlough them and claim for them. And again, I'm not quite sure how that fits in with the mm. overall policy aims. No, that, that again feels more like a safety net for the individuals who will then potentially really struggle to find an alternative. So it's it's good for them. Um, but it's, I think it's, it's at odds, doesn't yeah. it, with them not being able to furlough people who are self-isolating though? Um, yes. Because yeah. someone who you don't need in your business is going to get 80% of pay, whereas someone who's got to sit at home to do the right thing in terms of transmission has, has to have a significant drop in pay. Yeah, I think that is one of the points that has not been entirely thought through. Um, what should employers consider if they're thinking of re-employing and furloughing employees who have recently left? Well, I think the first thing is, is, is not to be led by your employee. I think if they phone in and say, oh, I only just left, you know, Rishi Sunak is, and, and, you know, Martin Lewis on Money Expert is saying that I can be rehired. Can you help me out? Obviously, most employers would think, well, I, I would like to, but I think you have to stop and say, we'll look into it and then go away and look at the dates, make sure they sit in those dates, and then think about, is it good for the business to do that? Um, and there are a number of reasons what, you know, why it could or it could not be. The factors I think you should consider would, would include the costs of re-employing and furloughing them. 
um, obviously, you know, a, a lot of employees would say, oh, you know, it doesn't cost you anything as a business to have me back and put me on furlough. And, and employers will know that's not true. It's very, very generous, the um, support from the government. But whilst they cover 80% of the salary costs they don't cover NICs and pensions that would be entirely at the cost of the employer and they also don't um, cover the fact that that employee would continue to accrue annual leave and they also don't cover the significant payroll and administrative burden that comes with furloughing people. One of the other factors I think you should think about if, if you're inclined to do it is think about how you want to contract with that uh, employee that left that you're rehiring did they have service which which has gone when they left and do we want to therefore make sure we rehire them in a way that in, uh, that breaks that continuity of service we don't want to be dealing again with having a fair reason for dismissal at the end or facing unfair dismissal claims from them um, probably one of the best ways to think about doing it therefore is rehiring on a fixed term contract and tying that to perhaps the end of January uh, when we know that the um, the levels of contribution from employers may be increasing. Um, doing it on a fixed term contract also makes a lot of sense now that you can't claim for people on notice periods. Um, you also need to think about, you know, what access to other benefits are we going to give them? Uh, and I think also we, we have for em employers that are asking us to help with it. We've been stating explicitly in contracts for rehire, we don't have to do this. We're doing it to, to give you the benefit of the scheme. And that is the only purpose of this, this contract. Um, I think it just makes it very clear from the outset for both parties why you're doing it. Um, finally, I think the, the other factors you want to consider are, you know, are you furloughing many other employees anyway? If you're not, it's not very attractive, I don't think, because you're putting yourself to a lot of extra work. But if they're just one in many hundreds of people that you're doing anyway, it's probably less of a concern for you. And finally, you know, some employers are taking approach of saying, well, I only want to do it in for certain employees that have left. For example, I might only do it if I, I might want that employee back longer term if business changes. That's absolutely fine to have a kind of a, a, a policy base on which you're, you're choosing to make decisions to rehire or not. What I would say is that it's good to sort of have some written not not strongly po formal policy but somewhere you've written down and somebody's thought about how are we going to decide who to rehire what what are going to be our policy reasons for doing it or not doing it because that just means that you can you can refer to that when you're going back to the employee and it gives you something to rely on to avoid um, argument, arguments about discrimination for not rehiring someone yeah yeah that's a really good point um so assuming that you have been through all of these different uh, thought processes and you are using Fellow for a second time, which very many of our clients are, James, what's the overview in terms of the practicalities and sort of technicalities of the written agreement with employees? Has anything changed there? Yeah, it's interesting on that one. I mean, I think one thing, one thing that we get a bit of a sense of, which is quite interesting, is that they're quite often there there's been this sort of assumption from employers that they have the right to furlough someone, that, that they can almost do that against the person's will, which I think it is important to remember. This is meant to be something being done you know, by agreement. We don't have a right to place someone on furlough. Um, now, against that, I mean, in terms of the written uh, agreements, yeah, it's always been a factor that, that employees needed to be agreed, needed to agree to be placed on furlough and that that needed to be confirmed in writing. If you think back, way back to the, uh, yeah, the the days when it sort of originally came in, you probably recall that there were some sort of initial worries, concerns, things there that um, well, the issue, the sort of guidance people put people on to furlough. We then had the first Treasury direction that that was sort of suddenly suggesting that uh, yeah, the employee's written consent was needed, and that that pose a lot of problems yeah, and some real concerns for people, particularly large employers, because what tended to have happened was they put people onto furlough very quickly, they sent them you know, nice letters and, and they were sort of relying on the, the implied consent of the, the, the sort of people because the practicalities around getting signed documents back from, you know, several thousand people in one go was just never realistically sort of going to happen. Um, as the scheme progressed, we had the sort of second treasury direction that made it clear you didn't need that sort of individual written consent, which which eased, eased people's minds quite a lot. And, and under the new scheme, that, that's essentially still the same. So um, it, it still has to be confirmed in writing by the employer uh, and there still has to be 
th th there's still uh, a point there that you need to retain that written agreement for at least five years after it's made, which will be really important in terms of um, you know, uh, HMRC audits around all this sort of later on down the line um, to, to keep a keep uh, and retain that written agreement in, in every case. Um, and th that can be email as well. You know, it doesn't have to be you know, a, a, uh, a letter as such. Um, but yeah, the new scheme there is absolutely, you, know, you still have to have that agreement in place. And, and uh, yeah, as a minimum, that needs to confirm that the employee is not going to do any work in relation to their employment or um, they're not going to work the full amount. Because bear in mind, we've still got this ability to, to either fully furlough uh, or to, to flexibly furlough with them working some hours and getting paid for those and, and um, being furloughed for the remainder of the hours. Um, I think it's probably important to say though, that there is a real distinction there. We, we, we've seen a few problems um, linked to it. You know, there, there is a big distinction between getting it right, getting the agreement right in terms of ensuring that you can then legitimately claim back money under under the scheme and in terms of getting it right in terms of um, it being really clear to employees what it means for them in practice and what they can actually expect in terms of their their pay etc um, because if you're not clear enough with the employee around what they're they're going to get in their pockets and yeah, in their pay packets under this agreement then uh, we've already seen a few where um, the employees have pushed back on on employers saying well actually um, you haven't paid me the, the amount that I was expecting, uh, even though they've paid the correct amount in terms of um, the calculation under the scheme, the employee's saying, well, actually, uh, that, that's not what I was expecting. That's not what um, it, yeah, the, the, that agreement sort of indicated I was going to get and bringing unlawful deduction of wages claims against the employer linked to that. Now, that's obviously not a position you're going to want to be in. So actually making sure that that, that agreement's really nice and crystal clear uh, around the arrangement is really important in relation to the, um, the relationship with the employee just as much as it is in relation to making sure you can reclaim the money under the scheme. Thanks, James. Um, I think that is all of the questions that we had had that we were going to run through. I don't know if anyone's got anything else they want to add this morning. That... Actually, one quick one, Karen, in relation yeah. to the written agreements that's probably worth just mentioning is is linked to the timing of that, of exactly when the written agreement has to has mm. to be in place. Because I think one thing one thing that we have seen that's sort of been put out there by by a few uh, different advisors and things is essentially a point suggesting that that written agreement has to be in place before the beginning of the claim period. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that individual claim period, which uh, I think we we found that's caused confusion for for for, for quite a few clients saying, well. Um, is, is that right or not? So just to put that quickly into context, you know, if that was the case, so uh, quite a lot of the time, most most uh, people are operating a sort of month monthly claim period. Um, now, if that was right, that the agreement had to be in place before the claim period, what that would mean is if, for example, um, you, you, know, you, you wanted to put in place that, that yeah, to, to furlough someone and put in place a furlough agreement in the middle of December, if that was right, you couldn't put an agreement in place then because yeah, you would have had to have been in place before the beginning of, of, of December to make that work. Um, that clearly isn't, uh, uh, we think, that, that yeah, we, what, what was sort of intended around that regard. And I think actually it does seem to be the case that some advisors have sort of just mis, misread the guidance because what it talks about is that the agreement has to be in place before the beginning of the the, peer, the period to which the, 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 yeah, that particular claim relates. Now, our view is that that basically uh, what that's referring to there is, is the period of furlough, if that makes sense. Mm. So what that's saying is you have to have the agreement in place before that individual's particular period of furlough but that doesn't have to be before the yeah that that particular the, the beginning of that the claim period in question. Yeah. But it is really important that that it the the new scheme does make it fairly clear that you can't put in place that agreement the written agreement retrospectively. So you can't stick someone on furlough and then 
you know, do the agreement sort of several weeks later. It has to yeah. be contemporaneous. So making sure you're getting those agreements at the point you put someone in furlough is really important. Yeah, but that is really helpful because obviously the most recent period of lockdown was um, uh, notified at quite short notice and certainly some businesses will have had to have moved quickly to perhaps call people and say you know we're not opening on on Monday um, you need to go on to furlough but perhaps it has taken a bit of time to get the agree the written agreement in place and sent out so okay there but don't let that period drag on you know do do an audit and make sure they've all got their agreements and that they're all they're all clear on what the position is, particularly obviously for that HMRC audit, which can take place down the line. Yeah, absolutely. I think also right. on the point of timing, Karen, um, in, in relation to claims as well, it's changed slightly. So from the 1st of November, you must submit claims by midnight, 14 days, 14 calendar days. Um, after the month that you're claiming for. So you don't want to be missing those deadlines anymore. So for example, um, if you're going to make a claim for November, you need to submit that claim by the 14th of December. Right. So, yeah. But I'm glad we're in time to tell people that. So yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yeah, keep yeah. an eye on that clock. Yeah, definitely. Well, particularly over, you know, perhaps over the Christmas period, if people have got time off and so on, you know, are these things all in the system and being done in time? Really important. Because if the business is relying on those costs being covered by furlough, you don't want to um, um, slip up by just not having pressed the button at the right time. Yeah, good. That's helpful. Great. Well, I think I just wanted to, to obviously thank our um, speakers this morning. I hope you've all found that useful. Those are the most common questions that we're being asked at the moment. Um, guidance is updated and changes. So do keep an eye out for our bulletins and briefings because we do um, try to keep on top of all the changes and let you know as quickly as we can when we see them what the practical impact is. Um, I also wanted to sort of just briefly mention for employees that are on furlough, thinking about you know keeping in touch with them, they can still do training and so on. It can be really tough for people to be placed on furlough. You know they're, they're suddenly not attending work. Work will have potentially been a really important part of their lives, particularly for people who are living alone. You know, and this period has gone on for a long time now, so there will be pressures on people, and they're still our employees. So it's important to make sure that people are checking in with them and that they're being given opportunities and also I think you know if, if the whole business isn't closed and only part of the workforce is furloughed being clear with other employees how much that period of furlough is potentially helping the financial position of the business so that you know that you haven't got those resentments I think we've heard about from some businesses between furloughed employees non furlough some employees who are not on furlough feeling like they're working harder than ever while their colleagues you know don't have to attend it, I think it's about that overall picture that we are going through a very unexpected um, and bumpy time and there are lots of different elements that business will need to use and different levers and um, furlough may well be one of those so just kind of that ongoing work really around describing why you're using it what it's for and making sure you look after the employees who are on furlough um, not an easy time for them uh, so next time we'll be doing a bit of a look ahead hopefully a more hopeful look ahead um, talking about things like vaccines can you force employees to have a vaccine what's the position on employers buying vaccines privately for their employees so that's all quite hopeful and optimistic that that's something that um, we need to, to look at next um, also we've separately got a business immigration webinar coming up so if we didn't have enough going on with COVID of course we've got the um, the real real start of the practical impact of Brexit happening at the beginning, beginning of January. If you employ EU workers, I absolutely recommend that you get in touch with us and watch that webinar because it will have lots of information in about what you need to do to make sure that you are complying with your, your duties for employing those workers. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that we have seen an increase in tribunal claims. I think the, the latest statistics show they're up 18% over the summer. That's not uncommon in an economic climate like this where it's more difficult for people to get jobs. We do tend to see a spike in claims, but do make sure that you have systems if you're not in the office at the moment to make sure that your post is being accessed in some way just in case there is a claim form waiting for you. I've dealt with lots of cases recently where 
um, the employers haven't been there to receive the claim forms. They're just sent in the post by the tribunal and then they've missed their, their short window of 28 days to lodge their defence. So just something to think about. I don't want to alarm you or put another task on your on your list of to do's, but it's something to think about. And also, you know, just that that picture in terms of tribunal claims, um, if they are increasing, just keeping an eye on that for contact from ACAS and sort of thinking about if you've got any any um, sort of problems that you knew about that might might arise in a claim. Just keeping an eye on um, what's happening with that. And obviously, if you need any advice, you can give any of us a call. So thanks for coming today. I hope that was useful and um, we will be in touch with you soon with details of the next webinar. Thanks.